Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see such a, a large and vibrant crowd. Welcome to Perspectives Asia. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd like to acknowledge our VIP guests for this evening. Our special guest, of course, Professor Daniel Bell, who I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later. Aaron Sito, Curatorial Manager for Asian and Pacific Art. Tara Cunningham, Assistant Director, Development and Commercial Services, Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. Graham Perrett, MP, Federal Member for Moreton. Mr. Gao, Deputy Consul General, Consulate General of the Republic of China in Brisbane. Mr. Watabe, Deputy Consul General, Consulate General of Japan in Brisbane. Captain Kasper Kulpa, Honorary Consul, Consulate of the Netherlands to Queensland. I'd like to also convey apologies for this evening from Professor Ian O'Connor, Vice Chancellor and President Griffith University, Chris Sains, Director of Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, and Professor Russell Trude, Director of Griffith Asia Institute. For those who have attended many of our Perspective Asia series in the past, you will of course all know that since its inception, the series has hosted a diverse range of speakers on, on various topics that look at Australia's relationship with its Asian neighbours. So covering all disciplines, the series has used topics from sport, cooking, fashion, art and politics to launch debate about the interrelationships of countries in the region and promote cultural understanding and awareness. The Griffith Asia Institute is of course delighted to partner with the Australian Centre of Asia Pacific Art, Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. I know that we at the Griffith Asia Institute have continued to highly value our partnership with the gallery and we are delighted to be co-hosting tonight's event. Many of you will already know, but this is the 12th year of the Perspective Asia series and our first seminar for 2016. Our next event, just to let you know, will be on the 28th of April with George Roberts, an ABC journalist who has just returned from Jakarta. Many of you may know George, who spent over 10 years reporting in Indonesia, and I'm sure he'll have many interesting stories to tell. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the Tourism Confucius Institute at Griffith University for this event. Yesterday, they held an international symposium on governance in China, in which Professor Bell spoke at. I would also like to thank Julian Rosendahl for performing the cello during reception. Julian is a talented graduate from the Queensland Conservatorium at Griffith University. And also, finally, thanks to our sponsor, Yering Station Wines. Finally, <laughs> I come to the main part. I am delighted now to introduce Professor Daniel Bell, Chair Professor of the Schwarzman Scholar Program at Tsinghua University in Beijing and Director of the Berggruen Institute of Philosophy and Culture. I did a little bit of research and I, I discovered Professor Bell is indeed a prolific figure in political philosophy, refracted through the experience of contemporary China. Professor Bell is clearly not afraid to ask fundamental questions that challenge conventional thinking as he prizes open the debate what some of the most important thinkers in the Western canon were fascinated by, that is the idea of meritocracy. After the seminar, Professor Bill will be signing copies of his book, The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy, which also will be available for purchase at the event. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please warmly welcome Professor Daniel Bell. Well, thank you for the overly kind introduction. And I should say that this theme of um, meritocracy, you probably know 
what is the one country around here that really discusses or puts forward this language? A small little country, Singapore, right? They call themselves meritocratic. Even China doesn't openly call itself meritocratic. So Singapore, it's often described as a, a small country that punches above its weight globally. Um, and I'm from Canada, which arguably is a bit like Australia, which is a big country that doesn't punch above its weight globally. But nonetheless, the theme of meritocracy goes way back, and it's not just Singapore, and it, and it goes way back in Chinese history as well. But before I go into that, I just want to ask a little question. So this museum, which I just had a lovely tour of, um, has a director, right? And the point of this museum is to serve the people like us who are visitors, right? In that sense, it's a bit like, like well, that's what a government's supposed to do. It's supposed to serve a people. But how did they choose? I honestly don't know, this, you know the answer to this question. How do they choose a director of a museum? It's, 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 some, it's a committee? Sorry? Well, well, what is the procedure? Just in one or two sentences, it's, it should be... It's merit-based application. application? Merit-based. Merit-based, right. Okay, so it's a merit-based, and then it's some sort of experts or people who have expertise in the area who, who make the decision. It wouldn't be left up to the visitors like us. We all have equal vote to choose the leader of the museum, right? That would be... Huh? Right, so that would be a bit a bit ridiculous. In fact, think about it, every single major social organization is kind of meritocratic at heart when it comes to the selection process of, of leaders. You know, whether it's a leader of a university, of a hospital, of a scientific organization, it's all assumed that you have to have experience to be a leader and that it's people who have experience and, and, and some sort of qualification who are part of the leadership selection process. Every single social organization in modern society works like that. But the one exception, strangely enough, is political community. In democratic countries, you know, whether it's a small village of a few hundred people or a big country of like one billion people, like India, it just assumed that regardless of experience is irrelevant, you know, qualifications is irrelevant. Everybody has one person, one vote to choose leaders, and the leaders needn't have any experience in politics. Like, think of Donald Trump today uh, in, in, in the U.S., you know. Now, just, if you just detach yourself a little bit, you know, I mean, I, I'm from Canada, so we're deeply embedded in this view that this is the only legitimate way of selecting leaders. But if we just detach ourselves a little bit, then it's just on the face of it, it seems strange that Oh, so here we have the most important organization of all with the power to like literally over life and death, you know, nuclear, you know, Donald Trump could have his, his hand on the nuclear button and yet it doesn't qualify, experience is irrelevant, you know, qualifications are irrelevant if he persuades, you know, people to vote for him and, and then the people also, they're not expected to have any experience, uh, then he's going to be our leader. But, well, I forgot not our, I'm from Canada, but if he, if he has his finger on the nuclear button, he would influence other countries too. Anyway, it's, so, it's a little bit strange, right, when you think about it. And, um, and, but to be frank, it's not just a theoretical issue. It's because this view that the only legitimate way of selecting leaders is one person, one vote, is so deeply embedded in the kind of the, the Western you know, ethos. It's almost become like a sacred value in the post-World War II era that... Um, that that it, it's, really, it's really hard to, to challenge that. And to be frank, the, I spent three years in Singapore, and there was all this talk about political meritocracy. I was very, very skeptical. You know, it didn't really succeed in changing my, my moral, intu or let's say my political intuitions. But then I've spent 12 years in Beijing, and I must confess, after repeated shocks to my, the moral intuitions that I was brought up with as a kid, uh, in a kind of fairly unreflective way, I think I became a bit more open-minded and saying, hold on a second, maybe now we should consider that there are morally legitimate alternatives to select and promote political leaders. And that's what my book is about. My, my book is not so much a defense of the political reality in China, it's more that it comes from my experience living and working in Beijing where people argue about these issues, you know. 
What is the best way of selecting leaders with above average qualities, above average social skills, above average intellectual ability, above average virtue? What are the mechanisms most likely to uh, select and promote leaders with those qualities? I mean, it's really Im hugely important questions. They were important in the West. You know, the most famous book in arguably in Western political philosophy is Plato's Republic, which is basically a very, it's a book long defense of political meritocracy, right? He argues that the political system should aim to select and promote leaders of superior qualities. And for him, it's philosophers who are totally committed to the truth and who don't have families and property and therefore can serve the whole political community. Um, John Stuart Mill, 19th century also, he was, of course he was famous for his defense of democracy, but he also worried that leaving the vote to those who don't have adequate experience and qualifications could lead to problematic outcomes. So he suggested that educated people should have an extra vote. Now, 19th century in the UK, that wasn't such a strange view, but now it would be ridiculous, right? Which political leader, maybe I'm wrong, in Australia or Canada, you know, could put forward such a proposal? Or in Europe, I had um, a, a, a student of mine from Italy, and she was horrified by Berlusconi, who's like the Italian Donald Trump. And, <laughs> and, and she says, the people who vote for him, like, she's saying, and again, based on, it's not just her view, but based on you know, empirical uh, data, that uh, they're just not very well informed. So she put forward a view that before you vote, you should have like pass a simple, like the equivalent of a driving test where you, you're asked 10 questions about two different political parties, very simple questions, just about the platforms of two political parties, not just one, so you have knowledge of some alternative. Um, it's a very sensible proposal, I think, right? Abstractly, but a total non-starter uh, because, to be frank, the big problem is that once people are given the vote, regardless of the case uh, against that, it's impossible to take it away except by military force, like in Thailand and Egypt, you know? I mean, show me a person who can look in the mirror and say, yes, I realize now that I don't have sufficient wisdom and virtue to select leaders, therefore I would agree that my vote be, have less value than, than somebody else. It's like, nobody's going to admit that. So once you put in one person, one place, it's almost one person, one vote, it's almost impossible to change except through military force. But China has a bit of an advantage in this respect, and maybe that it hasn't yet put in this process, and therefore is more open, or let's say allows for the possibility of alternatives. And what are those alternatives? Well, this is where this idea of political meritocracy comes from. And political meritocracy is basically a simple idea. Again, that the political system should aim to select and promote leaders with superior qualities, superior intellectual ability, superior social skills, and superior virtue. And that doesn't seem problematic, again, from a kind of purely, you know, abstract point of view, right? I mean, who would want to be governed by, like, first take superior intellectual ability. It doesn't mean that you have to, the, it has to be the most brilliant person in the world. It just means that somebody who has, let's say, slightly above average analytical ability, knowledge of how the empirical world works, good knowledge of economics, of international relations, of kind of cognitive biases that typically influence, in a bad way, people's thinking processes. Somebody who has slightly above average in, in those respects, you know, would be a desirable leader, right? You don't want somebody, again, I swear, I don't mean I'm Canadian, it's very easy for me to criticize the U.S., but you don't want somebody like, just imagine, you know, Sarah Palin, you know, mixing up, uh, you know, North and South Korea in a moment of crisis. I mean, you know, that's just, you don't want somebody like that, right? But you also want a leader who has above average social skills. And this is, for businesses, it's so obvious. If you read the literature on business leadership, that the most important thing is to have good social skills or emotional intelligence, like ability to persuade people, empathize with people, kind of know what they're thinking, engage with people of different characteristics, and, and be a good listener. Of course that's important for a political leader, right? So you don't want in a kind of academic nerd, you want somebody who also has above average social skills, who can engage with people, 
in, in, a, in, a, in a desirable way, learn from them, adapt what they think according to engagement with a wide diversity of people, and a kind of you know, ability to empathize with different points of view. Okay, that doesn't seem problematic either. And what about virtue? Again, virtue here, it doesn't have to be, you, know, you don't have to have like, you know, the Dalai Lama as, sorry, it's a bad example. You don't have to have somebody who's like, a great religious leader uh, also to be a political leader, like somebody who's totally altruistic and so on. All you want is somebody who's not very, who's at least partly committed to serving the common good um, and who's not totally corrupt, right? I mean, <laughs> you don't want a leader who's going to systematically misuse public funds for their own private interests, right? That doesn't seem problematic either. So the question is then, what are the mechanisms most likely to select and promote leaders with slightly above average intellectual ability, social skills, and virtue, at least in the minimal sense of not being corrupt? I think that's not very controversial that, we, yes, we do want to have such leaders, and we should be open to alternatives other than one person, one vote, as a way of selecting such leaders, okay? That doesn't seem so problematic. Um, on the other hand, we also want some sort of democratic process, meaning that we want, most people have, want to have some say in the political system. The political leaders should consult the people, take into account to a certain extent people's needs and interests, not exclusively, right? Because what the leaders do doesn't just affect, you know, especially in big countries like China or the US, you know, um, what the leaders do affects future generations affects the rest of the world. So you want leaders who are sensitive to the interests of all those affected by the, by the policies of government, including the people who are there now and future generations and people living outside the state. But of course the people matter. The people who are there now, their interests and needs should be, have some sort of say in the political system. And the leaders shouldn't be totally unaccountable, you know, unless you're from North Korea where, you know, wow, the leader's like a god, I'm willing to totally sacrifice for them. And, but, and of course, to be frank, totally brainwashed because they're close to what goes on in the outside world. Um, they, maybe they don't care about democracy, but the rest of the world cares about democracy, right? So the question is, how can we reconcile our interest in having leaders who are let's call them meritocratically selected and promoting, promoted, meaning they have slightly above average uh, intellectual ability, social skills, and virtue, and two, that there's some sort of democratic process in the selection process. I happen to think, and this is where my views arguably are somewhat controversial, although they're not controversial in Beijing, um, <laughs> that China has more or less a pretty good model for the selection and promotion of political leaders. Of course, it's a good ideal, and, it, and there's still a big gap between the ideal and the practice, but it's a good ideal that should be used as the standard for judging political reform in China, as opposed to the usual view where, you know, the standard trope, if you read the Western media, I apologize if this sounds a bit polemical, is that you know, there's been a lot of economic reform in China, uh, but no political reform. Oh, really? So the political system is the same now as it was in, during the Cultural Revolution? I mean, it's a totally different ballgame. What has happened since then? Well, what has happened, the main thing, is that it's become more meritocratic. There's been a much greater emphasis on meritocracy in the selection and promotion of political leaders. And this goes way back in Chinese history. You know, the main ideal in Chinese political thinking is this ideal of, again, I'm going to call it political meritocracy. And it started from Confucius, Kongzi in Chinese, when he had this idea that to be a Junzi, which you can translate as an exemplary person, bef before his day, which is about 2,500 years ago, you were there, you were, you were to be a kind of leader because of your aristocratic heritage, you're born in a good family with lots of land. He says, no, only those of superior ability and virtue can be junzi. So he really changed the meaning of what it means to be a kind of exemplary person from that you're there because of your money and, and, and birth status to one where it depends on your ability and virtue. This idea arguably has been the main political ideal in Chinese political culture. And in imperial China, 
It was institutionalized for much of Chinese history, let's say about 1,300 years until the early 20th century, by means of, well, two means. First, the most famous contribution of China to the rest of the world is what? A political contribution and in education is the examination system, right? They came up with it. They said, let's use exams to select those who have superior qualities. Of course, um, there's all these debates. What counts as superior qualities? And, and, and many uh, great thinkers, including Zhu Xi, you know, said, oh, it doesn't quite measure moral ability, uh, but at least it's a good way of testing intellectual ability. And no matter what university professors will say now in terms of we're all egalitarian and so on, but as a professor, we still use examinations to test ability, right? That comes from China. And so that's how, for much of imperial Chinese history, leaders were selected. By first, you had to go through the examination process. It was called the Keju system. And then you had to be, you had to perform at lower levels of government. And you had to do well at lower levels of government and then be promoted on the basis of good performance. So it's this very, and to be frank, clever system. First, you go through examinations and then performance evaluations at lower levels of government. This is almost exactly the same system that has been reestablished in form over the past 30 or 35 years in China. Some sort of examination process has been reestablished to get into university and to get into government. And then leaders are promoted. It's a decades-long process through performance evaluations at lower levels of government. And of course, the f content is different, right? In the old days, it was more the Confucian classics were, were the main things that leaders are tested on. And then performance evaluations was now, it's of course, it's economic performance that mattered most. But the for in form, the main, the, the, it was the same thing. So we have this, I this ideal of political meritocracy that has a long history in China, that has inspired political change in China, and that also, not coincidentally, is strongly endorsed by the people in China, the large majority, according to reliable political surveys. Lots of political surveys, I, I mentioned them in my book, show that, of course, we know China, oh yes, there's censorship. Yes, there is censorship. My own stuff is censored. I'm not going to deny that. But um, nonetheless, it's not like North Korea. People don't really know what's the alternatives. You know? when there are, you know, when there's U.S. presidential elections in China, it's all on TV. I mean, it's not as if people aren't aware of alternatives, right? Um, but nonetheless, there is strong support, according to political survey data, for some form of political meritocracy in the uh, political system. So why shouldn't we use that standard? Well, um, obviously, my, my view is that we should use that standard. So. Then, the, but the question is to go back to this uh, question is how then can we reconcile political meritocracy and democracy? Now, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time because I really want to leave. It's 6.30 now. What time should I finish? Or I want to leave room for, for comments and critical comments because apparently my views are not always uh, widely endorsed in the Western society. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Another five minutes. Oh, my God. Okay, so I haven't begun yet. But let me just jump to the conclusion then. Okay. The best way of reconciling democracy and meritocracy is what I call, or what, I mean, what, what has been termed vertical democratic meritocracy. And this is the view that democracy is a beautiful idea in small political communities. And Western political theorists have said this throughout history, starting from Aristotle all the way to like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Montesquieu. In a small community, the issues are fairly easy to understand. You know, do we build a road here, a road there? Um, it's easier to develop a sense of community. The people know the character of the leaders that they select. So there's a very good case for democracy at lower levels of community, at lower levels of uh, when it's a small community. But in a huge country, the issues are so much more empirically complex. The stakes are huge. If you make a mistake, it's huge. You know, do you invade Iraq or not? Do you deal with climate change or not? Australia, I hope you deal with climate change, but if you, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. If China doesn't deal with climate change, it is the end of the world, you know? So the stakes are huge. Um, and you want leaders who have experience and qualifications and ability to take into kind of long-term interest, not just of the political community, but of the whole world, literally. So, 
then the question is, so this is a, how, so how can then, could we have some sort of democratic process at lower levels of government with a more meritocratic process at higher levels of government? I think this is the key issue that has, in, that has really um, inspired political change in China. Um, but there remains a huge gap between the uh, reality and the ideal. So what, it, what, what is the huge gap? Well, very quickly, because I only have limited time. One is lack of democracy. Okay, democracy at lower levels is a good thing. China has democratic elections for villages. More or less, several hundred million people have participated in village elections, but they're flawed. I think there's been some progress, so that's okay. But democracy is not just about elections, right? There's a need for much more freedom of speech, much more freedom of association. Um, and I think as China modernizes, it's so obvious that this will become a more pressing issue um, because people want to have more say in government. And also, the government needs to devolve responsibility to other levels, uh, to lower levels of society when things go wrong, especially. They so, um, so obviously, there's a, there's, there's a problem. But the that can only extend to a certain point. In order to preserve the meritocratic advantages of the system, to be frank, and this is where my views are a little bit controversial, at least in the West, it has to stop short of the right to form political parties at the highest levels of government and the right to have one person, one vote. Because once you have that, it just literally wrecks the whole meritocratic process. What's good about meritocracy? The leaders don't have to worry about the next election. They don't have to waste time giving the same speeches over and over again. They could, they could, they could learn from the best practices abroad. They could take long-term uh, perspectives. Um, they could, they could uh, learn from their own experience you know, in, in, in lower levels of government. If you have one person on vote, you can basically kiss, kiss goodbye to all, that, uh, to, to all that stuff. So. Need for more meritocracy, meaning better, more free and fair elections at lower levels, more freedom of speech, more freedom of association, short of one person, one vote at the highest levels of government. And the meritocratic process at the top needs to be more meritocratic. Now, in terms of the ability of leaders and their social skills, anybody who has met leaders in China at the city level and above cannot but be impressed by their intellectual ability and social skills. Nobody, again, sorry, I don't mean to be always pick on the U.S., but nobody like Donald Trump could, could become like even a mayor of a, of, a, of a city in China. You just, you have to show that you're smart, have good understanding of economics at least, and uh, lots of social skills, meaning sensitivity and modesty. Anyway, um, <laughs> but obviously the problem is that there's a lot of corruption in the political system in China, right? So that's why, and corruption matters more in a, merito, in, in a system that aspires to be meritocracy than in a system that is democratic. Because in democracy, if leaders are corrupt, you just vote them out of power. No problem, right? Um, in a meritocracy, if the leaders are corrupt, it's a stake in the heart of the system because um, the leaders have legitimacy by virtue of being viewed as having superior uh, let's just say somewhat, uh, slightly above average, ability, social skills, and virtue. If they're corrupt, it means they don't have virtue, right? It means they're misusing public funds for their own private interest. So it, it is literally a stake in the heart system. And if you go back in Chinese history, you know, why did the Ming Dynasty collapse? Corruption was a huge problem. Why did the communists win in the civil war against the uh, KMT? Because they were viewed as less corrupt. They know, the rulers now, that if they don't deal with corruption, the whole system is going to collapse. That's why there's been the longest and most systematic campaign against corruption in recent Chinese history. And the optimistic news, perhaps, is that I think they will probably succeed. At least the odds of success are greater in China than in democratic countries that claim that they want to deal with corruption, like. Like, I don't want to select, you know, India or Indonesia. Even Montreal, where I'm from, is famously corrupt, you know. Um, but in a democracy, there's a kind of very easy way, of, uh, at least superficial way of dealing with corruption. You vote them out of power, but the next leaders may be corrupt. In China, if they don't deal with corruption, the system's going to collapse. So, I think that there will, I think it's already happening, you know, that there's much less corruption in the political system now. The, of course, there's a need for more independent supervisory institutions, a need for more freedom of speech, um, 
need for more Confucian and moral education, need for more separation of economic and political power. All these things are important, but I do think that um, at some point, you know, there, it has to be uh, either progress on corruption or the downfall of the whole political system, which isn't true in a democratic system. So maybe that's one reason to be somewhat optimistic, because in order to save the political system, they have to deal with corruption. So, um, again, my point is that what is the standard we should use to evaluate Chinese political reform? Let's just leave aside our prejudices, you know, that we were brought up with as children. Uh, sorry, I don't, I mean, I'm criticizing myself here because it took me like 30 years to change my views. Um, you know, and, and let's try to use the standards that are widely endorsed in, in Chinese society, have a long cultural heritage, and I think are a good way of thinking about how to govern a large country. So I'll end here, and I apologize if my views are a little bit controversial. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. And there's some very interesting ideas. I'd now like to open it to the audience for questions and answers. So please, anyone put up your hand. Yes, sir, at the back. Well, look, the a sorry, if I can pick up the second question first. Um, the Asian values debate didn't come from China, it came from Singapore. Nobody in China talks about Asian values. You know, Singapore, you know, they, they couldn't, uh, the Asian values is like a, a catch-all term to this, to kind of be politically correct about their own political system. And they should have just called it Singapore values, which places a lot of emphasis on, on meritocracy. But the basic point that we should allow for different ways of thinking about what are the appropriate standards for political progress and regress. I mean, whatever label we use for that idea, it's perfectly legitimate, right? Why should we think that there's only one way of judging political progress and regress, and it's, you know, whether countries move towards our ideas of liberal democracy? I mean, who are we? You know, I, I'm from, I mean, I'm from Canada, it's such a short history. Who am I to like come in here with like using the standards that I learned as a kid in Canada to judge China? It's ridiculous, right? China has such a long history, beautiful, you know, a culture, and, and, and it doesn't it make sense that we should use those ch standards that at least, not exclusively, but at least partly, are no, mainly, the standards that come from Chinese history and culture and that are widely endorsed by Chinese people today as a standards for judging political progress and regress in China, it's, maybe I'm missing something, but that seems to me, uh, uh, you know, an appropriate way of proceeding. So it's not my proposed system. Again, I'm trying to make sense of what goes on in China. At least what are the ideals that motivate the system and, and make it somewhat more systematic. And it's not an idea of selecting, like F Philosopher King, as, you, as you, I'm sure you know, comes from you know, this Plato's idea of the Republic, that the philosophers have to be, I, I, I don't think that's an appropriate model either. You know, philosophers are those who are like committed to truth and somehow they say this, the truths that work well in philosophy are the, are the best ways of thinking about uh, how to rule a society. I just don't think that's true, you know. Some philosophers have these, are great philosophers, but doesn't mean that they have good political judgment. Um, so, to, I think it's anybody who's slightly above, it's not what I think anyway, this is just, again, it's trying to make sense of the dominant ideals in uh, Chinese of political culture and political life today, that leaders should have slightly above average intellectual ability, and for that, I think examinations, I'm sorry if I say, 
uh, because I, I don't like exams myself. As a, you know, I remember a terrible memory as a student, and I didn't do well on many exams. But that's the best way of at least, let's just say, of deselecting leaders who who have you know below average intellectual ability. That's perfectly reasonable way, I think. Um, social skills, how do you select that? Well, by getting things done. If you could get things done at lower levels of government, means that you have a good way of persuading people. You know, the, the, sorry, the, the, again, I don't mean to sound too polemical, but often when you read the Western stuff on this, it, like, oh, patronage, it's like so negative. But if you succeed at lower levels of government, you know, through persuading people, then that's a good thing too, right? And then virtue, well, the problem is that the way of promoting leaders in China has depended too much on what the superiors think of you, which is a notoriously bad way of assessing moral character, right? Because if, like, let's just say that I'm being considered for promotion and all that matters is what my boss thinks of me, well, then I could be kind to my boss and mean to subordinates and the, the boss won't know about them, the, you know, this bad moral character. So I think peer evaluation is a much more, because uh, the people you work with at similar levels of, um, in the kind of hierarchy, um, they're the ones who are the best judges of moral character. And it's not just the Chinese government, but those organizations that are most successful. And here, let me say one good thing on behalf uh, of the US, you know, that the US military, whatever we think about what they do, I mean, but what they do comes from political leaders who are elected often through, you know, not, but as an organization, as a fighting force, um, they're there, they're supposed to sacrifice their lives on behalf of the community. How do you select those people? Virtue matters so much in, in the military. And one important way is through having, through the peers, the people at similar levels, they know, is this guy going to be on our side when we're facing death, you know? And so having much more emphasis on peer evaluation in the promotion process, I think, would be so important. In, in having um, a more virtuous leaders in China. So the big problem in China now in terms of that is, again, to repeat that there's too much emphasis on what the superiors think, you know. Well, it, yeah, sorry, so again, it depends what we mean by democracy, right? If we mean freedom of speech, freedom to associate, um, short of one person, short of like the right to form political parties, I'm all in favor of that. In fact, I think it's very important in, in China's political future to have more of that. And I, in the past year, or year, two years, arguably there's been a, regress, a regression in this respect. Um, and it, and it, but if by democracy we mean one person, one vote to choose the highest level of political leaders, then I do think, yeah, I mean, I think it's a bad idea because it'll, it'll really wreck what works about the meritocratic process now in China, which is that the leaders, I mean, it's, it's I don't know, maybe I've been, maybe I've been in, in Beijing too long, but just, you know, if you have to choose between, you know, two kinds of leaders, one who has lots of political experience, you know, um, who's good at persuading people, you know, who's passed exams uh, at different levels versus one who's like good at giving speeches in televised debates um, and giving the same speech over and over again. I, you know, what kind of leader would we want in a big country? I don't know. It just seems to me obvious that the Chinese political system is something going for it and we should build on that rather than try to undermine it. Okay, well, um, so, um, I, I don't think the party, uh, to be frank, I think is a bit of a misnomer, because when you think of the party, we think of like somebody who's like, you know, an organization of people who has their own, you know, very particular agenda. 
the, the Chinese Communist Party, it's the world's biggest political organization, has 88 million people. It's hugely diverse in terms of people who are members. Um, like in my own department of philosophy, you know, at, at, at my university, you know, um, you have like Confucians who are members, you know, liberals and socialists. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, think of it as this way, it's like this huge organization that aims to select and promote leaders from diverse sectors of society, including capitalists, so they're not even communists anymore, you know? So it, the, the term is misleading. It's not a party and it's not communist. It's this huge organization that aims to be, you know, meritocratic in its selection and promotion of leaders. Now, there's a huge gap between that ideal and what they do, um, and to repeat, you know, there's a need for much more freedom of speech and much more freedom of association within uh, society. But the idea of having this huge organization which is open to uh, diverse sectors of society and aims to select or to use a kind of negative word, co-opt uh, leaders from different sectors of society in a large country like China, I just think it's not a bad idea. So, uh, yeah. Sure. So, okay. First of all, I don't think elitism is. I mean, elitism is like all elitism is. I mean, you, any political meritocracy is going is want, it wants to select elites, meaning those who have superior, you know, abilities, social skills, and virtue. The question is, how do we get there? And and also the question is, as you suggest, those who are there be, at least partly because of their family backgrounds, it seems to suggest that the process is not sufficiently meritocratic. Now, on the one hand, I agree with that. On the other hand, we have to look at what happened, you know, in the 1980s. Um, so China was kind of primed for the reestablishment of political meritocracy because it had a terrible experience in the Cultural Revolution with, you know, radical populism and arbitrary dictatorship. And then they said, okay, now we need to focus on education, on reformers, you know, and those who are smart and innovative and so on. So many of those who were put on the fast track for political power in the 1980s were from, uh, you know, established families. They had, you know, they're the ones who often were more innovative and, and had more education. Um, and the examination process to select leaders was only put in place later in, in the early 1990s. So the current, many of the current leaders, including Xi Jinping, were put on this fast track 1980s. But given that now that you can't even get through the door, you know, without succeeding at examinations to get into universities and to government, this suggests that in the future there'll be less people who are there because of their, at least, let's say, partly because of their family backgrounds. But I want to make one more point, which is that, so meritocracy means those who are above average of intellectual ability, social skills, and virtue. And I think social skills, to be frank, if you're from a big political family, it helps, right? And it's not just China. Look at Canada, where I'm from, you know, you know Prime Minister Trudeau, when he was a kid, he was like, you know, he met the queen and, you know, and, uh, and he was, you know, dining with political leaders as a kid. I mean, he, you know, he had much better social skills than, than, than the rest of us. So it's almost natural that he would be put on the fast track for political power. Um, and, and so this is not just, so whether it's a democracy or a meritocracy, those who have above average social skills when it comes to dealing with political issues, if they're from political families, you would expect that they would have a better shot at government, and that's totally consistent with, with meritocracy, is the, the way that I understand it. 
chosen ones? And are those particular qualities or merits, who decides what's the most meritorious qualities? So there must be someone, some guru sitting above who makes those decisions. So who decides that? So yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, I don't think there's an answer that's like permanently embedded, you know, and I, I, this is one very good argument of freedom of speech, which is that, you know, a traditional argument of freedom of speech is that it's necessary to correct mistakes, which I totally agree with, but it's also necessary to identify new sources, or let's call them non-mainstream sources of those who have superior qualities that will be relevant for the future. John Stuart Mill, that was his famous argument for freedom of speech was not, not just that it's necessary to correct mistakes, but it's necessary to identify new elites. So I think China needs freedom of speech. In the past 30 years, it wasn't so, to be frank, it wasn't so important. Why? Because there was this consensus that we are a very poor society, we need to focus our energies on poverty reduction, the best way of doing that is economic growth, therefore we're going to select and promote leaders who have a good track record at economic growth. And you didn't have to argue too much, and it's worked. You know, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. But in the future, it's different, much more complex. What matters more now? Environmental sustainability, you know, reduction of gap between rich and poor, you know, a more flourishing cultural scene. Um, the issues are much more complex, and I do think that there's a need for much more freedom of speech for different kinds of elites to be selected and promoted within the political system. That, that said, there's still a need for an organi organization at the end of the day to make those judgments. And there isn't within this, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to call it the Chinese Communist Party, this organization, it's called, and it's called the Department of Organization, which has a specific task of thinking about those issues. At the moment, um, actually, they're a bit better than they used to be in the sense that they're more open and a bit more transparent about what they're doing, but they're still not sufficiently transparent. I think that organization needs to be much more transparent as well. I'll just invite Aaron from the gallery to give the vote of thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Professor Bell, and thank you, Dr. Turner, for. Should I sit here? No, no, please. Oh. <coughs> Um, I think you'll agree that that was a very fascinating presentation and a lively discussion, so thank you also to the audience. Um, I suppose, you know, we are in Australia about to enter into, an, into this whole election circus, so I think that some of those early observations around um, the organisation of, of uh, uh, our political systems uh, probably do resonate with us, but possibly we, will, we would here in Australia stop short when we have ideas about um, the suggestion that there should be no one person, one vote, you know, those, those very important um, uh, foundations, those franchises which are so important to, out to, to at least a Western conception of democracy and, and um, um, po political interaction and in in engagement. The other thing I suppose is uh, the inability to perform, to, to to create political parties, I think when we when we consider the the Australian context, it's such an important part of 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 who we are and how we how we have evolved. And I suppose the other thing that probably sticks in my mind as a as a person of of Chinese background, educated in the West, is this idea of of moral education. It's something that that of course is it definitely culturally back in in the, in the back of my mind, but not necessarily something that that I mean I I'm, I I kind of the, the hairs stand up in the back of my head, just on the back of my neck, just thinking about it. Really, <laughs> so there, I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of these discussions will will continue to resonate in our um, uh, in our daily lives here in Australia as we think about what's going to what's uh, what's about to to be presented to us in the next couple of couple of months. But, though I do one thing that I, I really do ag agree with is that is that when we do look at places like China or, or other um, um, you know, here at the gallery, we, we have a very we're, we're engaged with many places in in Asia and the, and, and the Pacific. It is also it is very important to to appreciate and understand the the evolution of of social and political sy systems within the context of of 
uh, long uh, cultural histories. I mean, these are uh, the, these are arguments which I think, from a from an artistic point of view, that we would um, that I that, that I at least um, um, uh, you know I, I I feel very very strongly about. So. The, you know, this partnership between Quagoma, Quagoma's Australian Centre of Asia Pacific Art and, the, and Griffith Asia Institute de delivers some of these really important conversations and thinking about Asia and Australia's relationship to Asia and the things that we can, we can learn about when we consider um, uh, the many transformations and, and the reevaluations of, of 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 these cultural and, and political histories, and I think that you know this being the first one that we've embarked on this year, hopefully sets a standard for what's about to come this year. I hope you will will join us again. Um, join up. I think uh, I'm sure that there's a, a a sheet out there if you're not already on the newsletter list to to um, to get further information. So on behalf of the gallery. Um, I'd like to thank you, Professor Bill, for this is a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I hope you will, will, will join us uh, in, in the foyer for, um, will join Professor Bill for some uh, signing, book signing in, in the foyer. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>